Hello everyone um, and welcome to a special session at the BES winter meeting to celebrate the life of Bob May, Lord May, who died earlier this year in April. My name is Charles Godfrey and I'm going to be the chair of this session. It's uh, particularly appropriate that the BES should celebrate Bob's life, both because he was one of the, if not the outstanding theoretical ecologist of his generation, and he was also president of this society. And Bob, of course, worked on many things beyond ecology, and I think we'll hear a bit more about that uh, uh, later on. Um, I'm delighted to say that Bob's wife Judith and his daughter Noam are in the audience with us uh, this, uh, this afternoon, this afternoon in the UK, I should say. So um, the session is going to be in two parts. The second part is going to be a panel discussion between people who work very closely with Bob at different stages of, of his career. I'll introduce them properly later, but it's John Krebs, Mike Hassel, Roy Anderson and Simon Levin. Um, but the first session, we are going to ask three people to do the extraordinarily difficult job of giving us a flavour of Bob's contributions to different areas of ecology and just in 15 minutes. And I'll introduce all three of the speakers at the beginning and then they'll go through the uh, talks. And the first speaker will be Tim Coulson. Tim Coulson is uh, co-head of the Department of Zoology at Oxford. Um, Tim will be followed by Professor Jennifer Dunn. Jen is Vice President for Science at the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico. And then our final speaker will be Pro Professor Alison Galvani. Alison is Director of the Center for Infectious Disease Modeling and Analysis in the Yale School of Public Health. And Tim will be talking about population biology, Jen about community ecology, and Alison about epidemiology. Now, um, we're not going to have a question and answer session, but we would encourage anyone to make any comments or reminiscence, reminiscences about Bob and put it in the Q&A section. And what we'll do is we'll gather them up and we'll probably uh, collect them together in the British Ecological Society uh, Bulletin. So with no further ado, can I ask Tim to um, unmute and begin his presentation on population biology. Over to you, Tim. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully you can all hear me and with any luck, you can see my screen. So first of all, thank you very much for um, asking me to uh, talk about Bob May's legacy to population biology. And I'm gonna try and explain why it's so important. It's a real privilege to have been asked to do this. And I um, hope I can do his amazing contribution some justice. So I'm going to start by just giving a very quick uh, background to bits of population dynamics before moving on to Bob's contributions. And time series of population numbers are central to um, all of ecology and lots of um, uh, uh, aspects of uh, biology, lots of subfields of biology. And we all know that these populations of uh, pretty much any species you look like go up and down in size over time. And biologists since the advent of the field have been interested in trying to understand why we get these dynamical patterns. Why do we see the patterns that we do and how do they arise and can we predict them? And these time series have interested people because they're central to ecology. As I've said, if you're a community ecologist, you're looking at the dynamics of time, of, of populations of interacting species. If you're an ecosystem ecologist, you're interested in how those population dynamics generate uh, flows of energy and uh, nutrients through ecosystems. If you're an evolutionary biologist, you're interested in how evolution might change the dynamics of populations. And although populations fluctuate, typically they do not exhibit long-term temporal trends. So they're not going up or down forever. I say typically because human activity has generated recent persistent trends, as we can see in this slide of the Living Planet Index below. And indeed, uh, one of Bob's contributions that I'll only mention very briefly is his work on trends and how that can lead to extinctions. But one of the things I think that uh, really characterized um, Bob's um, first and, and uh, incredibly important contribution to population biology around chaos is the observation that although populations often didn't show long-term temp temporal trends 
under natural conditions. So in other words, they would fluctuate up and down. Um, uh, he realized that they, they, would, they wouldn't show these trends. And if they did, we would see lots of extinctions. We would see changes in species pools and community turnovers. We would see lots of successful invasions and we would see lots of community rewiring. And what Bob appreciated is in natural systems, these events are, are relatively rare. And one of the things that we've been changing in the natural world is um, we've actually been altering a number of these processes. But, and Bob actually went to make important contributions in all of these um, topics. Um, but his first uh, uh, um, major contribution uh, around chaos was appreciating that populations fluctuated but did not generate long-term persistent temporal trends. And he was interested in why that might be the case. And he realized that for a population to um, persist and not go up or down indefinitely, that it required some sort of density dependence. And that density dependence could be driven by competition between animals for food, or it could be driven by apparent competition for predators or competition for a territory or for space. And, and that's all very well, but why didn't that just, that, although that led to some stabilization, why did we also see these fluctuatings over time? And it was when pondering this question about population um, regulation that Bob famously discovered chaos. And the figure that you can see on the right here is how if you change the parameter about how quickly a population um, uh, can grow when there are abundant resources, how the dynamics change. And so when the value on the X um, axis here is relatively small, we see that the population settles down to a single point um, and, 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 and remains there. However, as we increase this parameter and we increase the strength of density dependence, what we started to see is first of all a bifurcation where the population would go and show these two point cycles and then the cycles would become more complicated and then you would eventually get um, chaotic dynamics. And, and Bob realized that these uh, chaotic dynamics, these very, very simple models, sometimes with as few as um, two parameters, uh, could generate time series that certainly qualitatively looked um, as uh, a little bit like the populations that we see in the wild. So the populations, you, you would be able with the right sort of density dependence, so the density dependence that we see with this parameter, this high population growth rate in the, um, in the diagram that we've got on the top right of this slide, that once the values of that parameter of the population growth rate when uh, resources are abundant, that uh, the populations could show these dynamics that certainly looked a little bit uh, qualitatively like those that we see in many natural systems. And so what, this what Bob realized here is these patterns occurred is when you sort of got what's known as now as overcompensatory density dependence. So the population would shoot up above the um, carrying capacity. There would then be a lot of competition between the individuals there for food and the population would decline. But it's incredibly sensitively balanced. So the dynamics uh, would go up and down. They don't repeat, but they are predictable. So they're, they're, um, they are in fact deterministic. And so what I think is really interesting about Bob's work, when you go back to this original 1976 paper, when he discovered chaos and introduced it, is he realized that although you could get parameter values where you could see these chaotic dynamics, and he was able to plot this graph on the right here, where we've got the population growth rate and um, we have the types of dynamics described where on the sort of um, towards the bottom left corner, we have uh, populations that are going, um, they, they damp down and go to single points, right the way through up to the right hand corner where you see chaos. And what Bob was able to do, he was able to take some life tables from both laboratory and field experiments and he was able to populate this 
graph that shows the dynamics of uh, um, uh, the simple logistic, um, discrete time logistic map. And he was able to demonstrate that there were uh, one or two systems that demonstrated chaos. But in fact, a number of natural systems um, didn't. And actually, I think this, this is a really amazing example of Bob's insight, because uh, he realized that, yes, chaotic dynamics almost, uh, that, that simple equations can generate um, complicated dynamics. And he also realized that some biological systems appeared to be chaotic, and indeed, uh, in the years since we've, um, we've done this, uh, we've found many, but he also realized at this early outset that these, that not all systems were going to be chaotic and therefore not all time series were going to be determined by relatively simple rules such as the discrete time logistic he worked on. And it's interesting because many biologists saw this paper and they thought, uh, particularly during the 1970s and 1980s, they spent a lot of time looking to see they'd take a time series and they'd look to see whether they could identify a simple equation that gave really accurate predictions around, um, ab about that. But rereading Bob's 1976 paper now um, and, 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 and looking at this figure, it, uh, I, I realized that Bob had actually, although discovered something incredibly important, realized that it was going to, it did occur in nature, but it wasn't necessarily going to be determining the dynamics of lots of systems. But interestingly, a lot of biologists spent a lot of time trying to identify the, the simple equations that would generate patterns in, in data that they saw. So again, I think it was a, not only an incredibly important insight, both mathematically in terms of what simple equations could do, but even back then, Bob realized before a lot of many other biologists realized this, that although these dynamics do exist in nature, they're not, chaotic dynamics are not necessarily ubiquitous. But Bob went on and, um, uh, you know, chaos, he first of all considered it in time, but he also considered it in space. And when I was a PhD student at Silwood Park, which was the first time that I met Bob back in the early 90s, I used to see this picture on the wall outside Mike Hassel's um, office. And uh, this was actually taking chaos and putting it into a predator-prey system in spatial dynamics. And I used to look at this, uh, this, this, this picture for a long time. And I remember Bob actually um, explaining this uh, to me very, very clearly, but it's always struck me as, uh, as, as sort of starting the Laura Ashley School um, of Ecology. But I think it was very nice because Bob showed that chaotic dynamics, not only uh, along with Mike and, and Hugh in this case, not only generated temporal interesting patterns, but could also generate interesting spatial patterns. I don't have time to go through all of Bob's um, amazing contributions to population biology here. And he did do much more than chaos, as I alluded to at the beginning. He also worked on extinction and extinction debt. He also worked on evolutionary aspects and considered, did some um, influential work on evolutionary gains. He could considered coevolutionary dynamics, and we may hear a little bit more about that in the um, other talks. A lot of important work on predator, prey, and host parasitoid dynamics, and in particular, what might stabilize unstable um, systems. He worked on dispersal. He worked on niche theory. He worked on population management. So how did he take these biological insights and apply them to manage populations? And he also worked on the impact of climate change. And the contributions he made here in each of those fields were significant. And if I ever think that I'm doing too well, I go and look at my citation um, outputs compared to Bob, and I realize that um, uh, I realize what a truly astonishing contribution he made in all of these areas. So why are Bob's contributions so important? Well, I think that what um, Bob was able to do is he had a really unique skill set of breaking down the complex problems into manageable forms. And I think this came from the fact that not only was he a very, very capable mathematician, but having come from physics, he sort of understood the power of simple models at a time when many biologists don't. But there are many good mathematicians and physicists who've come over to biology, and Bob's real ability was not only to have astonishing insight in maths and physics, but also a really good understanding of biology. He had an intuitive understanding of biology and how to break it down. And he showed how you could really hone in on the key um, uh, aspects of a system to go quite a long way to understanding the dynamics. And he has shown his work 
really helped bring mathematics to population biology and showed how simple dynamic models can provide a normal enormous insight into very complex complex systems for example how just changing the strength of density dependence can generate such a wide range of dynamical patterns as he demonstrated in that 1976 paper and he also demonstrated how these analytically tractable models can provide really um, enormous insight of the natural world and the work that he's done um, has uh, really allowed biologists to actually take the enormous complexity of the natural world and to boil it down into manageable chunks. And although we don't um, have the ability to often predict the dynamics of the natural world accurately, what Bob has left us with is tools that allow us to really go a very long way to understanding why the types of dynamics we see in populations are observed. And Bob's work has not only driven the field of research in population biology um, over the, the last um, half a century or so, it's also fundamental to what we teach. So we teach Bob's approaches and his papers in all years, for example, of the population um, biology degree. And I just want to end with um, an anecdote that Bob uh, told me um, uh, a few years ago when I asked him how he came to come across to um, to, to ecology. And he told me he had a meeting um, with Robert MacArthur. And um, halfway through that meeting, the phone rang and uh, Robert MacArthur picked up the phone um, and said um, something like, it's okay, and put the phone down. And a little later, Bob discovered that uh, um, uh, MacArthur used to do this. If he had a meeting, he wasn't, if he, he thought he wanted a way out, he would get his secretary to phone in and stop the meeting uh, or ask him, uh, give him an excuse to stop the meeting. I'm really pleased to say that that never happened in any of the, the meetings that I had with Bob. The phone uh, never rang and I was never chased out. But I, I, I'm not sure I can say that with every member of the panel that we've got talking later. So I'd like to wrap up now and just say um, it's been a real pleasure. Um, it was a real pleasure to know Bob and it's been a real pleasure to be asked to say a few words today about his contributions to population biology. They have been immense. Um, they have uh, um, that you know, they have guided the field for the last um, uh, uh, um, since those uh, key papers in the 1970s, and they will continue to do so. It was an honour to know Bob, and um, uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Rest in peace, Bob. Thank you very much, Tim. And one of the shames of the Zoom format is you can't hear the resounding round of applause that there would have been. Um, could we go to Jen? Professor Jennifer Dunn, who's going to be talking about Bob's contribution to community ecology. Great, and I assume everybody can see and hear, so, oops. Okay, great, uh, greetings from uh, snowy Santa Fe. And uh, it's also an incredible pleasure and honor uh, to be, giving a few minutes of oversight into Bob May's uh, impacts, huge impacts on community ecology. And this is my one slide summary of Bob's <laughs> career. <laughs> uh, and uh, of course, the three talks today are representing these different areas where he had huge impacts, community ecology, population biology, and disease dynamics. You heard um, from Tim about population biology. Allison will talk about epidemiology next. And I'm representing community ecology, <laughs> which is a large task. Um, and uh, the way that I think about uh, Bob and his impacts on community ecology has to do with the many, many dimensions of how ecologists think about and study diversity, complexity, and stability in ecological systems. And of course, uh, these different areas, community ecology, population biology, and disease dynamics all bleed over into each other. Um, but underlying all of them, of course, uh, apart from Bob's contributions to these topics, um, are his huge um, contributions in terms of bringing mathematics and theory uh, to biology and ecology in particular. Um, so we've already heard some of that in the context of population biology. This is a slide that I, a variation of the slide I've used in many talks that I'm introducing um, ecological network research, which is what my expertise is in. Um, and so I, I basically 
tell people or talk to people about this framework of the 1950s paradigm that complex communities are more stable than simple communities. Um, a challenge that came in the early 1970s that complex communities uh, may be less stable than simple communities. And then uh, the current and future research, uh, uh, which uh, focuses on devious strategies that promote stability and species coexistence. And of course, that 70s challenge came from Bob. Um, but just to go back in time a little bit, um, uh, since ecology has been a formal discipline in the late 1800s, and actually I'm sure well before that, um, uh, ecologists have been thinking about what ecological, st ecological stability is, what it looks like, uh, what, um, what creates it. Um, Stephen Alfred Forbes uh, published a paper in 1880 where he talked about various aspects of stability in the context of interacting organisms um, and for example said it's a general truth that those animals and plants are least likely to oscillate widely which are preyed upon by the greatest number of species of the most varied habitat. Um, the backward oscillations of one set of enemies will be neutralized by the forward oscillations of another set. Um, by the 1950s, you have uh, people uh, like Robert MacArthur, who <laughs> will come up repeatedly in Bob's history, um, who was borrowing uh, ideas from information theory and thinking about how a large number of paths through each species is necessary to reduce the effects of overpopulation of one species. And, and he started to talk about the relationship between um, the number of links, um, among species and how that relates to stability. Stability increases with the number of lengths increasing. Um, and then other uh, kind of things fall out of this. And MacArthur, of course, um, is one of the people that helped get Bob to Princeton in 1972 and then unfortunately passed away from cancer and Bob in effect took over MacArthur's uh, uh, place at Princeton. Um, you know, following MacArthur and a number of other uh, ecological researchers, this very much became conventional wisdom that complexity begets stability. Uh, G. Evelyn Hutchinson, in his very famous paper from 1959, homage to Santa Rosalia, why are there so many kinds of animals? Um, and the American naturalist wrote, um, modern ecological theory therefore appears to answer our initial question, at least partially by saying that there is a great diversity of organisms because communities of many diversified organisms are better able to persist than our communities of fewer, less diversified organisms. However, uh, in the 1970s, we have this heretic from down under uh, and from the world of theoretical physics, basically suggesting that, no, you can't, get, that's not, you know, we have to look at this in a more simple mathematical framework. And actually, in many cases, what you would expect to see is that complexity undermines stability. And this, of course, was put forth in his extremely famous 1972 paper, Will a Large Complex System Be Stable? And then the follow-up book in 1973, Stability and Complexity in Model Ecosystems. And uh, what Bob was uh, building uh, this work on were, were analyses, a simple mathematical framework that allowed uh, him to look at local asymptotic uh, stability or an equilibrium is locally stable as small perturbations away from the steady state always decay, returning the system to the equilibrium. So what he was in effect doing was bringing this mathematical, this theoretical approach um, using um, where close to equilibrium nonlinear systems are approximated by a set of linear equations. Um, the benefits of this are clear. It's analytically tractable in general approach. Um, the drawbacks, at least according to a lot of biologists and ecologists, would be that it strips away the realism of the systems um, in the name of uh, simplicity and analytic uh, tractability. Of course, uh, for Bob and many other people, this was a feature and not a bug, um, but it was of great distress to a lot of ecologists and biologists. Um, and, um, and of course, it was within these works where May's stability criterion was put forth um, which basically showed that communities of interacting species will be stable if uh, the average interaction strength or the diversity, the number of species or the connectance, which is a measure of complexity, the probability that two species interact do not exceed in critical values. And thus it follows that increasing mean interaction strength, diversity or connectance um, increases destabilizing positive feedback loops, decreasing system stability. And this is, an, to me, an incredibly important few sentences uh, for ecology that come out of May's book. 
In short, there is no comfortable theorem assuring that increasing diversity and complexity beget enhanced community stability. Rather, as a mathematical generality, the opposite is true. The task, therefore, is to elucidate the devious strategies which make for stability in enduring natural systems. So in one fell swoop, or in a couple of fell swoops, <laughs> in the early 70s, May, uh, Bob introduced one of the first theoretical, empirically testable mathematical ecological frameworks that could be probed, supported, and attacked. Um, and he inspired many lineages of research over several decades into the present, resulting in thousands of papers that sought to elucidate uh, the devious strategies of ecological complexity, diversity, and stability. Um, for example, I mean, it was just nice. I mean, even this very simple um, framework that he put forth in the early 70s immediately, immediately lent itself to empirical scrutiny. Um, so uh, if we, for example, if we assume that interaction, uh, mean interaction strength um, is constant, which of course it isn't, but they couldn't get at interaction strengths at that point. But since then, of course, there's been a ton of work on interaction strengths. If we assume I is constant for communities with increasing species richness to be stable, connectance, complexity must decrease accordingly or vice versa. That implies constant um, connectance times species richness, um, which uh, transforms it. It basically implies that uh, links per species should be constant. And this is a testable hypothesis. Links per species is invariant across natural communities. And shortly thereafter, Joel Cohen started to put together the first databases of uh, food web data. Um, and he and others started to look at uh, these and other kinds of patterns um, in order to probe and test and in some cases attack um, what Bob had put forward. So this was really the beginning of the search for patterns, origins, and implications of ecological network structure. And in terms of the devious strategies that Bob challenged everybody to go out and look for, well, people went out and looked for them. Um, and in particular, looked for different ways and how to structure and dynamics um, interact to promote stability and robustness of complex ecosystems. And just within an ecological network framework, which is one of many possible frameworks for looking for these devious strategies, things have, things have been proposed over the years, including non-random community structure, disassortative, disassortative linking, uh, non-linear functional responses, consumer resource body size ratios, uh, non-uniform uh, distributions of interaction strengths, preferential feeding at low traffic levels, resource uh, resource switching by generalists, structural robustness, and the balance of trophic competitive and mutualistic interactions. And there's many others. These are just a few examples. And each of these is represented by dozens and dozens or more papers. Um, and there is a direct line, as far as I'm concerned, between Bob's work in the early 70s to my own research and the research of everybody else who does anything in ecological networks, um, food webs, mutualistic um, networks, um, et cetera. And um, I, I published my first food web papers in 2002. And, and then also this had a book that came out, an edited volume in the Oxford uh, in, at Oxford University Press that Mercedes Pasquale and I edited. I'm pretty sure that every chapter in that book harkens back to the original May papers um, and work as well as uh, more recent work. And um, basically, I mean, he just, he made kind of modern ecological network research possible and, uh, and set the foundations for it. And so I'm incredibly grateful for that. <laughs> And also I'm incredibly grateful that Bob uh, took an interest in, in my work and the other work of, of uh, more earlier career people um, as they came along and as ecological network research started to unfold. And indeed, uh, Craig Lyman and colleagues published a review of uh, Primer on the History of Food Web Ecology, Fundamental Contributions of 14 Researchers. And there, the third person that is listed and has a little mini chapter is uh, Bob May on food web complexity and stability. So his contributions are deeply and widely appreciated and fundamentally important. Of course, it's this is not just about ecological network structure. Um, hit the work from the early 70s, as well as a bunch of other work that he published um, in later years, not just on uh, stability and complexity, but on other community ecology and population biology topics. It gave rise to all, just diverse topics and lineages of research, um, simple to complex trophic dynamics, intera interaction strengths and trophic cascades, 
ecosystem stability and robustness, species persistence and coexistence and niches, biodiversity and ecosystem function, macroecological patterns and theory, spatial dynamics, extinction rates, causality and ecological modeling, and of course, uh, applications in conservation and management. And he also, of course, had a huge influence um, through his leadership and involvement with the two most important uh, monograph series in ecology and uh, biology and evolution. Um, so the, of course, the Princeton University Press monographs in population biology. And then when he moved to Oxford, the Oxford University Press Oxford series in ecology and evolution. And these are just examples of two more recent books that came out in those two series that um, come straight out of uh, Bob Foodweb Ecological Network lineage. So in addition to doing an enormous amount um, within ecology, um, both through his own research and through his inspiration and challenges that inspired um, scores and hundreds of other researchers and lineages of research, and in order to try to understand uh, the complexity and diversity and the stability, enduring stability of, of simple to complex uh, natural and less natural ecosystems. He actually took all this in his later career and uh, looked at it in terms of the complexity and stability of financial systems. And so there was a whole series of papers, uh, starting with this Nature 2008 paper that came out just a few months before the Lehman Brothers collapse, Ecology for Bankers that he wrote with uh, Simon Levin and George Sugihara, and then did a series of papers with Andy Haldane um, and others um, about systemic risk, size and complexity and model financial systems, um, all these kind of topics. And he explicitly said in, in one of these papers that they um, he was drawing analogies with the dynamics of ecological food webs in order to look at the complexity and stability of financial systems. So as well as having a huge impact on our understanding of the economy of nature, he was starting to have a big impact on our understanding of the ecology of financial systems. And I just, I'll close. Um, this is a quote uh, from a, a colleague of ours, Jeremy Fox, um, uh, who has a blog called Dynamic Ecology. He wrote a very nice piece about Bob after Bob passed away. And, um, and I just like the way that he stated this. Um, uh, he wrote, and it was actually in a comment, there's a stereotype about theoretical physicists naively thinking that all other disciplines would benefit greatly if only some theoretical physicists would move into those disciplines and make some simple mathematical models. Um, this is a stereotype that we're accused of often at the Santa Fe Institute, which tends to be home of theoretical physicists who are doing anything but theoretical physics. Um, but Jeremy goes on to say, Bob May shows that the positive, uh, Bob May was the positive version of that negative stereotype. His example shows that if the right theoretical physicist moves into the right non-physics discipline, then yes, that discipline actually can make a leap forward it otherwise wouldn't have made. And um, I couldn't agree more with Jeremy and the sentiment. Uh, this is actually a photograph of Bob in the Santa Fe Institute Library. Um, in addition to all the myriad other things that he was doing in the world in um, science and policy, um, he also found time for a while to be very involved. He was basically a part of the second wave of founders of SFI, the Santa Fe Institute, and served as the chair of the science board for a while. Um, so it was my pleasure to be able to get to know him a bit and have some very nice dinners with him uh, through his involvement with SFI. Um, anyway, thank you very much, uh, and thanks, Bob, for everything you've done. Yeah, and that was wonderful. Many thanks indeed. Um, we'll go on now to the last of the three talks, which is given by Alison Gilvani, talking about Bob's contribution to epidemiology. Alison, over to you. Are you able to see my slides? Not yet. Um, does that does that work? No. no, nothing so far, I'm afraid. We know it works because it worked for yeah. when we were <laughs> practicing. Um, Amy from the BES, do interject if you have any suggestions. Uh, 
Hi, Alison. So it should be the share screen at the bottom. Can you then yeah, see the probably. application? Chrome, maybe it's... Uh, um... Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, we can see it. But that's the, let's see, <laughs> that's, let's go back to the beginning. Okay, thank you so much, Charles, for the invitation to speak at this session. It's an honor to have this opportunity to share some thoughts about Bob May's seminal contributions to epidemiology and public health. I was profoundly privileged to have been supervised at Oxford by Bob from 1999 to 2002. He was extraordinary in so many ways, and one of those ways was in seeing the potential that mathematical modeling had to transform myriad fields from environmental conservation to banking. Uh, Bob's transformative impact on epidemiology dates back to 1976 when he published a landmark paper entitled Simple Mathematical Models with Very Complicated Dynamics, in which he wrote that mathematical models he had derived could be applied broadly to biology. Bob recognized that while the goal of the epidemiologist to eliminate diseases is the reverse of the conservationist aim to preserve species, disease systems are governed by the same principles as ecological population systems. So a few years later, um, in 1979, Bob collaborated with Ray Anderson to lay the foundation of compartmental models that now underpin the field of epidemiological modeling. So virtually everything that has come since in the field is an application or an extension of these elegant models. Bob appreciated our not as the single most important parameter that governed epidemiological dynamics and herd immunity thresholds necessary to curtail disease incidents. Further, he delineated the direct and indirect effects of vaccination programs. Until his 1982 paper in Nature, people were focused on the direct effect of vaccination. So when a person is vaccinated, that person is protected up to the efficacy level of the vaccine. But Bob pointed out that the indirect effects on transmission should not be dismissed. Uh, so vaccination diminishes the force of infection in the population at large. Um, and this, of course, is generally a good thing. But Bob cautioned against potential unintended consequences that deserve consideration in the development of public health policies. So one such unintended consequence can arise for diseases that are more severe at older ages. In reducing the force of infection, vaccination programs will increase the average age of infection and the impact on older ages specifically as shown in this figure from Bob's paper. So consequently, a vaccination program may exacerbate the severity of cases that do occur while reducing the number of cases overall. Um, this problem, as he pointed out, can be avoided by achieving vaccination coverage that surpasses the herd immunity threshold. So Bob used um, rubella as an illustration of the issues that can emerge um, so while rubella is typically a mild infection, it can cause very serious congenital rubella syndrome in infants whose mothers were infected during pregnancy. Uh, so in the first few years of implementing the policy of only vaccinating 12-year-old girls, the number of cases of congenital rubella syndrome actually increased in the UK. Um, I, I'd speculate that if Bob had been advising the UK government at the time, he would have emphasized the imperative for a more rapid and more extensive implementation uh, to achieve herd immunity much faster and avert the tragedy. 
Uh, however, it would be several years before the UK government had the benefit of Bob's advice. Uh, both the elegance and the real world utility of Bob's epidemiological modeling, I think is exemplified by his work on HIV, again, in collaboration with Roy. They published the first projections of HIV in sub-Saharan African countries at a time when the incidence there was very low. Um, and in their work, they identified key gaps in epidemiological knowledge. So specifically, there was much empirical uncertainty around the probability that an infected person would transmit to their partner, which was key to the accuracy of projections. However, their analysis of the available data indicated that this transmission probability depended relatively little on the number of sexual acts within the partnership. And consequently, they were able to apply a relatively simple but data-driven model to project that HIV could be devastating. Um, by contrast, the WHO generated a model that was much more complicated. They had incorporated considerable demographic complexity, for instance, but they had not sensibly represented the transmission probability in their model. So they had assumed that the, that the transmission probability compounded independently for every individual sex act. So in other words, they assumed that one sexual act with 10 different partners was exactly the same in terms of risk as 10 sexual acts with one partner. Um, so at the time of these projections, ironically, the WHO model was heralded as more realistic due to its demographic complexity, um, whereas the model developed by Bob and Roy was regarded as overly pessimistic. However, as the pandemic unfolded, Bob's projections of a heavy burden of HIV in sub-Saharan Africa proved to be much more reliable. And um, you know, I know this was one time when Bob said he wished he had not been right. So over the course of a three week hiking trip that um, Bob liked to reminisce about, Bob and Roy drafted the outline for their 1991 book. Um, and despite the awe-inspiring rapidity of their work, it is a comprehensive consideration of infectious disease modeling from force principles, over 700 pages, <laughs> that remains the gold standard in the field. Between 1995 and 2000, Bob was the chief scientific advisor to the UK government and then president of the Royal Society for the subsequent five years. Uh, during his service, he was instrumental to government responses around disease outbreaks, agricultural practices, and climate policy. Um, uh, for me personally, it was inspirational to see mathematical modeling so effectively applied to improve public health policies. Um, beyond the direct impact of his research and public service, Bob was and extremely, he was extremely generous to students and postdocs, as I had the privilege of experiencing, experiencing firsthand. Although Bob was the chief science advisor and president of the Royal Society when I was his student, we had tea together at least once a week, sometimes two, three times a week, and he even taught me how to play croquet. So, on that note, these are just some of the first generation and second generation trainees of Bob May who themselves have gone on to make contributions to their respective fields. Um, as an aside, um, Simon Levin and I are compiling a list of Bob's trainees. Um, we just started a few days ago. And if anyone is aware of students or postdocs we've missed, which uh, I'm sure this is an incomplete subset, um, we'd be grateful if you could reach out to let us know. Of course, it's challenging to do justice to the breadth and depth of Bob May's contributions to the field. Um, and 
Altogether, for instance, his work has been cited over 160,000 times, including over 7,000 times just this thus far this year. Um, and, you know, as remarkable as that is, in a sense, it's not surprising. His groundbreaking advances are currently being applied in every dynamical model of COVID-19 to optimize public health responses. And in this way, Bob continues to guide us through the COVID-19 crisis with immeasurable benefits for humanity. So thank you again for the opportunity to share my thoughts about this extraordinary man. Alison, Alison, thank you very much indeed for that. That, that, was, uh, that was really great and lovely to hear some of those uh, reminiscences. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go into the second part of the celebration, which is a panel discussion. And can I ask the members of the panel to uh, make themselves visible and unmute? Um, we've had a few um, questions and reminiscences in the Q&A function. And, and please, those of you who knew Bob or have, some, or have been influenced by Bob, please do add something there. The way it works, I think it's only visible to us here. It's not visible to the participants, but we will uh, harvest all of them. And as I said, um, we'll do something in the uh, British Geological Society Bulletin. So I, I'm going to fairly briefly introduce the panel. I say fairly briefly because we have four extremely distinguished scientists here. And, and if I try to do them full justice, it would take up all the time. So let me just briefly say who's here. Uh, first, John Krebs. John uh, Krebs, Law Krebs, is by background a behavioural ecologist and has done many jobs and worked very closely with Bob uh, in the last couple of decades on science policy and a variety of other issues in the UK. We have Mike Hassel. Mike, you've already uh, encountered in the talk, uh, worked with Bob extensively in the 70s, 80s and 90s on predator prey and host parasitoid. Um, uh, population dynamics. Um, we have Roy Anderson, who can simultaneously write a 700-page book and walk in the uh, in the Alps, and I suspect we'll hear a bit more about that. Roy is a, I should say that Mike Hassel was at Imperial College at Silwood Park, and Roy's been at Imperial College in Oxford and is a professor of disease, infectious disease epidemiology at Imperial at the moment. And finally, Simon Evans. Simon is at Princeton. Simon is a theoretical ecologist and is director of the Centre for Bio Biocomplexity at Princeton. Um, Bob was born in 1936 and went to university, I think originally to read chemical engineering then, and then rapidly switched to physics. And from physics, he went on to do graduate work in the theory of, super, um, of um, superconductivity. Um, and he had a faculty position in physics, but became interested in ecology, influenced by ecologists in um, Australia. Um, Simon, how did he come to occupy the very prestigious chair of um, ecology at Princeton that, that Bob McCarver had so sadly advocated? And thanks, to Charles, for the opportunity to, <clears throat> to talk about Bob. Um, let me go back to Australia. Bob and I shared a lot in common and bonded early because we both came from the quantitative background you described uh, with concern for the environment and interest in, in putting our talents to work in theoretical ecology. Bob had, as you've already heard, distinguished himself as an astrophysicist in Australia, but his, but his concerns for the future of the planet and our assaults on the environment drove him to expand his horizons. Charles Birch, who was one of the superstars of Australian ecology, was also at the University of Sydney, a colleague of Bob's. And at Birch's suggestion, when Bob went to the Institute for Advanced Study near Princeton on sabbatical in 1971 or so, uh, he wandered over to the university to meet with uh, Robert MacArthur, the leading theoretical ecologist of his time. As we already heard from Tim Colson, MacArthur was initially hesitant about having to spend time with a physicist possibly toying with ecology. But once he met him, his opinion changed. They obviously hit it off. And their paper together on the limits to diversity and species packing had all the ingredients of um, what both of them brought to it. A strong connection to the fundamental ecological question and brilliant 
utilization of deep results from mathematics and mathematical physics. I, I really enjoyed that paper immensely, especially a wonderful application, obviously Bob's contribution, of a trick of Berlin and Kotz for imposing artificial cyclic boundary conditions on a large so-called cyclic matrix to approximate its eigenvalues. I've used that trick since, uh, and I learned it from that paper, as so many of other uh, things that Bob brought over and introduced into his other papers. Bob suggested, I'm uh, sorry, MacArthur suggested that Princeton hire Bob, and the department agreed, but Bob was initially resistant. Back in Australia, Judas suggested to Bob that he rethink this, that it would be a good idea, and convinced them to call John Bonner to see if Princeton's interests remain. It did. And Bob came to Princeton, uh, sadly, as MacArthur's replacement, because uh, MacArthur um, had passed very quickly after their meeting. Bob came to Princeton to replace MacArthur. He quickly rose to prominence, became the chair of the university research board before he left for Oxford. Everybody that I talked to and have talked to from that period of Princeton still remembers Bob fondly and his influence. For whatever reasons he left, which I might add opened up a position for me, he remained close to Princeton, encouraged me to take the position when it was offered, maintained a visiting appointment, visited regularly, and endowed a fellowship here for a graduate student. Um, I don't know whether you want me to add, I'd like to add a little bit more, Charles, about um, Bob's uh, philosophy of, of approaching these problems if I have another minute. Yeah, go ahead, Simon. Yeah. So Bob, as you've heard, published a series of influential papers on chaos, on thresholds, et cetera, that helped set the agenda for ecology for many decades. He won the second MacArthur Award after uh, Bob Payne. Um, I, I should say that when uh, Bob May came to, to the U.S., he made it a point to, to visit Princeton, to visit University of Washington, talk to Payne, and to come to Princeton, up to Cornell, where I was at the time, to talk to David Pimentel and me. He went on to become the president of the British Ecological Society, the Royal Society, uh, and to win multiple international prizes. In all of his work, I would say he brought the insights of an analytical mind to bear on, on a model following Einstein's formula, make it as simple as possible, but not more so. Um, and, and he brought that to bear on, on, uh, on exposing the essential aspects of the problem. Um, he anticipated and um, interest many years later, which we're seeing today on thresholds and breakpoints and critical transitions. He clarified work on diversity and stability. He elucidated the potential for chaos and simple models. I think he was always more interested in the steep part of the learning curve. In other words, in creating a framework, to a, a quantitative framework that others could build on before moving on to a different problem. And, and I think that accounted for his remarkable diversity and range of influence. Like his work with Roy Anderson, which as you've heard is the most influential work in the development of mathematical theory of epidemics, or his work with Andy Haldane that came after the papers that, um, um, that Jen talked about, he, um, he recreated field and built on analogies, but went well beyond them. So I think I should stop there. Um, well, it's a you, real honor. Simon, could I just ask a question? That, what was the genesis of the paper with you, Bob, and George Sugihara? What, what made Bob think about banking for the first time? Well, I suspect that Bob had been thinking about it before, but George and I took part in a um, meeting sponsored by the... Um, by the New York Fed and the National Academy of Sciences on systemic risk and banking systems. Uh, and a report came out of that meeting. And after that meeting, George and I said, we, you know, we really ought to um, interest Bob in this subject. That was not very hard. And so um, Bob obviously saw the, uh, the great parallels between the um, work he had done on complexity um, and in and interconnections in um, um, ecological systems and the increasing interconnectedness in the banking systems, um, 
and we published the paper in six months, I should say, before the financial crisis crash in which we pointed out these similarities and said, who knows, for example, where the current concern over um, subprime loans will end up. Well, we know where it ended up. But Bob didn't stop there. He went on uh, to work with Andy Haldane uh, and to, and, and to uh, get down in the weeds, so to speak, uh, on those problems. And just to interrupt there, Andy Haldane is the chief economist of the Bank of England and is actually the, one of the most celebrated economics thinker in the UK. And when Bob died, we had a lovely letter from Andy saying how much he enjoyed working with Bob and how much he had learned from Bob about uh, complexity. Um, Mike, could I come to you? Because I think you actually met Bob uh, a little bit before he visited uh, Princeton. Yes, indeed. Um, I first met Bob in 1971, I think it was. Um, he visited Silwood Park for a day while he was um, on sabbatical at Cullum Laboratories near Abingdon. And anyway, as a result of that day at Silwood, he and Judith decided to spend part of the summer of 1972 at Silwood Park. And uh, for, um, I think it was a, uh, several weeks, uh, a group of us, there was Gordon Conway and Christine Schumacher, I think, and Dick Southwood. Uh, we worked on, on single species population models. Uh, we talked about how increasing density dependence leads to um, monotonic approach to equilibria and then damped oscillations and then stable limit cycles um, that Tim uh, has talked about. And then of course, subsequent to that, Bob very quickly uh, made the analytical jump uh, to ask what happens when the density dependent feedback is increased yet further and and so he unleashed the whole plethora of chaotic dynamics uh, in in population models and uh, that was just an amazing um, period and um, I suppose it was staring in the face of many of us around that time but only Bob really made the jump and saw how important it was and um, that uh, well, that was crucial. Anyway, but, uh, Bob, I mean, I, he, he must have enjoyed that, um, that period in, uh, in summer because he and Judith then decided that they really would like to come to Silwood every summer. Um, and indeed, they bought a house nearby, near to Silwood, uh, for just that. So they had somewhere to stay when they, when they came. And um, apart from... Um, uh, a lot of science, um, a lot of croquet. Uh, those summers also involved um, uh, the rather celebrated walks where a group of us would um, walk ourselves ragged each day, um, talking science, gossiping a lot, of course. Um, and that started in the UK and then they would go for a few days to the mountains in Europe. Um, Bob, had the power to weight ratio of, um, of a lean mountain goat, I suppose. So it, it was rather depressing the way he would run up the, uh, run up the slopes. Um, I do recollect on one occasion um, when we were all coming swiftly down the mountain and Bob suddenly had a, a, a twinge in his, one of his knees and most people would then have um, stopped and taken it easy, uh, Bob just turned round and ran down the mountain backwards. Um, amazing. And there, there are wonderful treasured memories of those walks. Uh, and they just kept growing. Um, ah, that's nice. Nicer than looking at me anyway. Um, yes, I mean, the amazing thing is uh, they just kept going. Um, and uh, as we grew older and wiser, um, it went on for over 40 consecutive years. Um, and and, and Mike, if I might, Mike, if I just might interrupt there, just for people who don't recognize, who, we, we can all see you with the uh, tremendous dress sense in your yellow uh, jacket, but might you say who else is in the picture? Well, from uh, right to left, as I'm looking at, there's a, a young and handsome looking Roy Anderson. Then comes um, equally handsome looking Bob May, um, as rather scruffy Mick Crawley than myself, Jeff Woggy, 
you might um, just see next to him and the late Stuart McNeil right on the left. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, I mean, that was a group, that picture I think uh, came from Roy and is in the late 70s. Uh, the, the, a characteristic of all those walks were that they involved um, a number of very good friends. Some of them in that picture, but there was John and Dot Lawton, apart from Mick Crawley, John Beddington was there often. Uh, Roy is in that picture. And then a little bit later came John Krebs, uh, Charles himself and Andy Dobson and, and many others. Um, I don't know whether you can remember this occasion, uh, Roy, uh, in particular address him. Um, we stayed at the Scale Hill Hotel, I think it was, near Buttermere in the Lake District, and Bob had decided to walk back in the pouring rain uh, several miles uh, while the rest of us uh, got in the car and drove back. Uh, much later on, um, we were a little bit worried and an exhausted Bob returned, uh, burst into the hotel, ordered a brandy and ran up to have a bath. And that was the only time in over 40 years of knowing um, Bob that I saw a drop of alcohol pass his lips. Um, wonderful person. memories. Anyway, back to you, Charles. Mike, can I ask just a, a question on the science you did with, um, with Bob? So oh, you, yes. uh, you worked on both predator prey and um, host parasitoid population dynamics. And that was a field that had largely been developed by applied entomologists, where the tradition was to build very large simulation models with as much detail in as possible. Was there a, how was Bob's approach to looking at the uh, dynamics of pests? So how was it received by some of the more traditional groups in that, in that field? Um, I think there was a dichotomy. Um, entomologists did like to put every feature of behavior into models. And as a result, it was rather difficult to disentangle the component effects of each on population dynamics. And um, I suppose the work that Bob and I did through the 70s and into the 80s was really a, a much more stepwise introduction of features of behavior and life history that one could look at in turn and um, decide how they might affect population dynamics. And um, uh, I think that work then, um, uh, I think it did permeate into the applied entomology uh, but there was always the dichotomy between what you can do with relatively simple analytical models and what you can do with big simulations, capturing more of the real world, but not quite knowing what each little bit might be doing. Thank you. Um, Roy, how did you and Bob begin to work together on, on epidemiology? Well, I, I was a postdoc with uh, Morris Bartlett in Oxford in the biomathematics department, and Morris Bartlett drew to my attention um, some of the early papers of Bob. And so at the end of my postdoc, I was looking for somewhere interesting to go and somewhere, somebody interesting to work with. So I wrote to Bob um, and then he wrote back and said, well, actually, I'm going to be coming to Silwood Park, where Michael and uh, Dick Southard had attracted in the summer. And so in, I met him in 1974, along with Judith and Noam, um, and that was the beginning of a, a long and very productive relationship indeed. I should just add to, to Michael's story, I do remember that the brandy, which we all rather hope would um, have an impact on his ability to play billiards, snooker or slosh, <laughs> didn't seem to have any effect whatsoever. <laughs> so competitively, he was still in very good form that evening. Um, Anyway, post that uh, 1974, we worked together often in the summer with um, Michael and S at Silwood. And eventually, after a period of time, um, we started with an interest in ecology, largely because 
Silwood was dominated by entomologist Charles. You remember this with you and Michael. And, Long may it last. <laughs> yes. And we were always told that insects dominated the world. And my view was, well, you're rather ignoring the smaller organisms, the, the viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and so on. And perhaps they have an impact on the regulation of animal and plant populations. So we started to put together some simple models which had the classic structures of Norman Bailey a long time ago, but we put full demography into them and then explored how different types of pathogens could influence population dynamics. And one of them, of course, was very much chaotic. It was uh, simple uh, viral dynamics in which um, there was some seasonality could lead you into very um, extraordinary chaotic cycles. Then eventually um, we got sort of a little bit challenged by if you looked at infectious disease epidemiology, it was classical statistics dominated. There was no population ecology in it at all. And yet really, I mean, the human host was a dynamic demographic individual with a lot of behaviors. And so we started to get interested in taking the ecological insights into human infectious disease epidemiology. As you can imagine, the, uh, the medical community itself was somewhat cynical about this to start with because they very much had the traditional epidemiological approach using statistical methods. But it was a very productive relationship. What I really remembered about Bob, and Simon's already mentioned this, is he had this most extraordinary ability to take a complicated problem and simplify it to a few equations which permitted analytical exploration. And very sadly today, with the great increase in computational power, most postdocs and students now reach for the computer to simulate first rather than trying to get some analytical insight. So I think Bob's approach is still as pertinent today as it was then. Moving on to um, writing the book, we had met um, somebody called Ken Warren at a meeting in America, who was the director of the infectious disease program at the Rockefeller Foundation. And we were talking to him over dinner about whether it would be sensible to put the work we've been doing together in a book. And Ken said, well, the Rockefeller Foundation owns um, uh, a very large and delightful mansion on the shores of Lake Como in Bellagio. Would you like to spend a month there under a scholarship from the Rockefeller Foundation to write it? And both of us thought that was a pretty good move because there were mountains behind and there was Italian food, etc. And so we arranged uh, around about Easter time to, to go there for a month. And in fact, the book was written in a month in the terms of the actual writing part. What we hadn't realised, though, that the hard bit of writing books is putting the references in, doing the figures. And in those days, you had to do figures by letter set. You didn't have PowerPoint and complicated, lovely things that made life easy. And so it took another two and a bit years to get all these figures and references done and the fine bits under Judy's uh, very careful help as well from Oxford University Press. And then eventually in 1990, we decided to call it a day and not update it anymore and uh, send it to Judy for, for publication. But the last, the other thing I wanted to say about all this actually with Bob was that aside from his brilliance intellectually, it was always fun. You know, it, it was funny that whether it was the walking trips, whether it was individually working on a problem, and I had the privilege, Michael was there too, of a long trip in Australia once, um, everything was fun. You know, it was, it, we worked hard, but he had an extraordinarily mischievous sense of humour. And that remains with me as much as the intellectual contribution to. The combination together just made him an absolute pleasure and a delight to work with. I remember an anecdote about you, Bob and Michael, nearly killing each other on the Grand Canyon. Is that true? Yes, well, Bob had, well, I can remember this. Bob had this notion that we could ignore the rules about how much water you needed to take down to the bottom. Um, so um, we would go down to the bottom and up in one day, taking very little water. Well, going down was fine apart from the puff adders and god knows what else but coming back up with rather little water was a little bit challenging and Bob had also hadn't told Michael and I we were in a dry hotel so even when we got back to the hotel there was no beer or anything of that ilk so but there were many trips of that ilk which were really great fun.
I remember that anecdote because I made the mistake of uh, telling it to my wife the night before we did the rim to the river walk and she made me carry 20 litres of water just so we wouldn't repeat your, your issue. Well, um, I took, um, I took two drink. cartons of um, uh, orange juice, small ones. Yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, Roy, uh, uh, Alison mentioned some of the complexities with modelling HIV and that this was uh, doing epidemiological modelling where you were getting into the sort of um, the details of uh, human behaviour and human sexual behaviour. And I remember at the time that the government was unhappy with having to talk about some of these things in public. Um, was that a time when Roy, uh, when uh, Bob... Um, for the first time really began to understand the UK science policy world and to become involved with it? <laughs> well, actually, I think the first thing was the meeting both of us went to in New York, um, which was about the crisis and how one could help get scientific help in deciding what might be sensible interventions and also the impact of the early drugs. And there was a very contentious discussion between the behavioural sexual scientists, some of them from the McKinsey Institute and so on, um, and they kept on going that, well, you can't count the number of sexual partners. And I remember there was an episode where a particularly fraught exchange occurred, and the comment was that, well, even the Bushmen count one too many. Why can't the behavioural scientists? <laughs> and so um, so that, was the, that was the beginning of a poor relationship, and it, it got worse after that. But... Uh, Essentially, Bob found a very clever trick of including into the differential equation structures a deterministic approximation of the full distribution of the number of sexual partners per unit of time. And that introduced the heterogeneity that was required to make more sensible predictions of the course of the epidemic. And it also laid a foundation to look at, look at the impact of various drugs. In fact, one of the papers we wrote in Nature at that time pointed out that some drugs that from a very big multinational pharmaceutical company that were on the market could actually make uh, transmission uh, much more intense over the longer term for various reasons I won't go into. And that caused a little bit of a, an interaction both with industry and with the Department of Health about policy. But Bob was very, very good at explaining complicated things simply to policymakers. Thank you. Um, John, can I turn to you? I, 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 I want to ask you a bit about working with Bob in the House of Lords, but before that, um, when did you first start working with, you'd obviously known Bob for, for decades, but when did you first start working with him on public policy? Was it when you were chair of the Food Standards Agency? It was when Bob uh, became government chief scientist. And the first part of that, I was chief executive of the Natural Environment Research Council, and later on, I was in another public uh, policy role as chairman of the Food Standards Agency. And Bob and I um, used to run together every weekend on Saturday and Sunday. And we'd always use those running opportunities to discuss uh, science and policy questions of various kinds. Often, Bob came up with a very clear answer how he was going to deal with a problem. And I would spend the next three or four miles saying to him, Bob, you can't really say that to the Prime Minister. Can we try thinking of a different way of putting it? And sometimes I have persuaded him, sometimes I didn't. But what I think is really quite extraordinary about Bob, and we've heard the amazing contributions he's made in science, uh, made in science, but equally he played a transformative role in the time that he was government chief scientific advisor. He wasn't really a natural choice for the job in the sense that he wasn't an establishment figure. Uh, and he said himself that when he was approached by headhunters, it came, as he put it, gobsmackingly out of the blue. But I think what we've heard from Roy and Michael and uh, Simon and, and others is that Bob used his incredible intellectual horsepower to identify the essential simplicities of complex problems, which of course is exactly uh, a, a requirement if you're trying to explain to politicians or to the wider public a complex scientific problem in simple terms. And added to that, Bob, as others have said, had a real talent, a real knack for the deaf turn of phrase. So he could uh, explain something in simple terms, but also in memorable terms. And um, 
also, he was absolutely fearless in speaking out in, in, in relation to the scientific evidence. Um, just to give you a, a couple of examples of his um, role as a high profile media communicator, which was something that he brought to the job of government chief scientist that hadn't really existed before. The other, his predecessors were all backroom boys. I say boys advisedly because they were all male. Bob became a high profile public figure. Um, I also did a lot of media work when I was chairman of the Food Standards Agency and I remember one occasion in which on the Today Show, for those who are not for, familiar with the UK broadcasting system, that's the BBC morning kind of news current affairs programme, I was asked a difficult question by the presenter and my answer was, well, I'm afraid there's been a cock up. And I was uh, roundly told off by my uh, press officer when I left the studio saying you cannot use that kind of language when you're representing Her Majesty's government. And I said, well, Bob May does it all the time and he's government chief scientist, to which the reply was, well, Bob's Australian, that's different. So Bob had a way of saying things in blunt, but very accessible and uh, memorable terms. Another occasion I remember was when uh, the Royal Society for Protection of Birds had produced um, a, a very critical comment about the field trials of GM crops that were going on in, in uh, Britain in the late 90s or early noughties. And Bob and Judith had planned to go on a walking holiday uh, near Portofino on the Ligurian coast in, in Italy the very next morning. And Bob uh, cancelled the holiday in order to appear on the Today programme and refute what the RSPB had said. And he never forgave the RSPB for that cancelled holiday uh, in the uh, subsequent years. Just coming back to what he did as government chief scientist, as Alison has said, he dealt with specific issues like uh, GM crops, like uh, BSE, uh, other less well-known things, the uh, decision as to whether or not to evacuate the British overseas territory of Montserrat in the Caribbean, where there was a volcano called Soufre that erupted and spilt a cloud of ash over the capital city of Plymouth. Uh, but more importantly, in some ways, Bob left two key legacies from his time. The first were, uh, is the legacy of the uh, government chief scientific advisor's guidelines for scientific advice and policy, in which Bob emphasized three principles, acknowledge uncertainty, seek a wide range of views from the scientific community, because naturally not all scientists will agree, and um, be completely transparent uh, about how the decisions and the advice um, was, uh, was reached. And I think in today's um, uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, sometimes some of those guidelines have not been applied in quite the way that they should have been. Uh, but nevertheless, that was a very important legacy. His other one was analyzing, this is a UK focused legacy, analyzing the performance of British science in terms of bangs per buck. And that led to him looking at how many highly cited papers were produced by UK scientists, how many uh, international prizes and comparable awards like Nobel's, Crawford Prizes and so on had been won by UK scientists and expressing that not as absolute numbers, but as uh, dividing by uh, the population size or the amount of money invested in science. And that really gave politicians a clear view uh, that science in the UK was doing incredibly well in relation to the investment that was being put into it and became a powerful argument for maintaining and increasing the science budget. Uh, just finally, because I've gone on probably a bit too long, uh, when Bob talked about scientific advice, he drew an interesting and very sort of characteristically um, uh, simply expressed distinction. He said many problems, scientific problems in which politicians need advice are routine problems in which, as he put it, reagent grade scientists can do the job. Standard, you know, beta plus scientists who are rigorous can, um, can give a thorough analysis of the data and present it as a, as a, as a scientific uh, advice in relation to policy. There are other problems, and uh, be, uh, uh, HIV in Africa was uh, an example, where it was uncharted terrain, what Bob called uh, the clean rock face, 
with no handholds of previous science to, to grip onto. And for those kinds of scientific problems, you needed someone who wasn't a reagent grade scientist, but someone who's a true leader and innovator in the field who could actually tackle something where uh, the field was largely unexplored and unknown. Bob, might you say something about uh, working together in the House of Lords, and perhaps because we have quite a few people tuning in from outside the UK, j just how the House of Lords works as a, <laughs> yeah. in, uh, in 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, very. just before saying that, I wanted to echo something that Roy said about Bob, that he was great company. The way I would put it is that he was always a half a glass half full person. So he'd look at things in a positive light. If the things went wrong, he'd see an advantage in a learning opportunity or the way to make it better. Turning to the House of Lords, it's, uh, the UK has a bicameral parliament and the upper house, uh, the equivalent of the Senate is the House of Lords. It's entirely appointed. There's no uh, democratic election, uh, but to compensate for that, the House of Lords is subordinate to the elected chamber, the House of Commons. What it mainly functions as is a scrutiny and revising chamber of legislation. So we crawl through legislation, uh, often spending uh, many days going through a, a draft bill, a uh, line by line, uh, trying to improve it and correct it. And the members of the House of Lords, many of them are experts like Bob and myself, who can apply their expert knowledge to try and improve, uh, improve the law. Uh, that's one function. The other way in which the House of Lords works is by scrutinizing government action and holding the government to account through the functioning of select committees, which are cross-party groups of uh, members of the House of Lords who can call in witnesses, including government ministers, and ask them hard questions. Both Bob and I, as members of the House of Lords, Bob was and I am, are non-party aligned. Roughly a quarter of the members of the House of Lords are called cross-benchers, independent, not political appointees. Uh, coming to what Bob did, interestingly, although Bob was a brilliant orator, a really, really skilled debater and speaker, he was never totally comfortable with the rather stilted formal style of the House of Lords. So for example, if somebody is speaking and you want to challenge them, you simply stand up and wait till the person who's speaking notices that you're standing up and they give way. And then you say, I am very grateful to the noble Lord, I'm very grateful to the noble Baroness, and I'd like to make a brief intervention. Bob was impatient. And I can remember one occasion when uh, uh, Matt Ridley, Viscount Ridley, who is hereditary peer, there are a small number of those left in the House of Lords, was speaking on a topic. And Bob was livid with what Matt was saying. He leapt to his feet and shouted, Matt, you're wrong, <laughs> uh, which is very Bob, but completely inappropriate in the House of Lords. And there was a general mutter of opprobrium. But where Bob was at his best was in the select committee scrutiny and holding ministers to account. And I just want to mention one example because it's so resonant uh, uh, today. Back in 2009, Bob and I were both members of the Science and Technology Select Committee, and we did an inquiry into the topic of pandemic preparedness. And I can remember Bob, with, like with a scalpel, uh, taking the health minister apart. And I'll just read out two conclusions that that uh, uh, investigation led to. First one, we are disappointed that the assessment and testing processes and other activities connected with UK pandemic preparedness were not sufficiently well advanced. I mean, that was absolutely true in the spring of uh, 2020, just as it was in the spring of 2009. And then a second conclusion, a pandemic could place extraordinary pressure on critical care capacity. We invite, and this is typical House of Lords polite language, we invite the Department of Health to provide more detailed information about the current basis on which critical care contingency arrangements for a pandemic have been made, which is a polite way of saying you haven't got a clue what you're doing. So there were two wonderful examples of Bob's razor sharp analysis, teasing out uh, policy failures, which sadly, uh, 11 years later, the government hadn't put right. Yeah, what a great example. 
Um, we're coming towards the end now, and there's one last thing I'd like to touch on. I, I'm so glad everyone has mentioned just what fun Bob was. I mean, just extraordinary, uh, extraordinary company. Um, the other thing, he was immensely competitive, and he used to joke that he hadn't found any human activity which he couldn't turn into a game. And I believe, and, and, and Judith, forgive me if I'm misquoting you, but I believe, Judith, that, that you used to say that Bob was the only man you'd met who played with a dog to win. Um, so Simon, I was, I was going to go to you. Um, the Eno Mile, which uh, he set up in Princeton and that you are reconstructing at the moment. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Muted. Simon, yeah, you're, you're asking me. I, I must tell you that I never took part in the uh, uh, in, in the Eno Mile, but yes, Bob was uh, uh, was very competitive uh, in that. And when um, one year um, a, a ringer was brought in, Bern Heinrich, who many will you will know, um, was a, a, essentially a professional uh, runner uh, at virtually every distance. Bob was not particularly happy about it. Uh, Andy Dobson's on this call, and perhaps we'll uh, uh, we'll know some of the details. But I, I, I think that, that Bob did hold the record for for a number of years until Heinrich um, came around and 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 broke it, uh, running part of it backwards, as I understand. <laughs> uh, but yes, the uh, the um, the Eno Mile has been reconstructed, and uh, we we now have some uh, almost professional runners. Um, in it, uh, nobody. Yeah, I, could I just add, Simon, that um, I looked up the stats on this, and Bob uh, regularly, this is throughout his uh, 40s and probably through into his early 50s, finished the mile in under six minutes, which is pretty impressive. I mean, that's a good speed for a 20 year old, no matter a, a 40 to 50 year old. And he, ac according to the record, he overheard a couple of students talking about um, running to keep fit in the EEB group. And uh, he challenged them to a mile run in the Princeton Stadium, uh, which he did win, as you say, he, he won the first Eno mile in six minutes, 12 seconds. So Bob's uh, competitive streak uh, came through then. When I used to run with him, um, we typically run five miles at Blenheim Park. And there was always a kind of sprint at the end um, to Bob wanted to get home ahead of me, which he usually did. And he quoted from an Australian country and Western song that he loved called, or oh, the chorus went, only the hard yards get you home. <laughs> so that was Bob's attitude, the hard yards get you home. Yeah. Um, Charles, we, uh, we haven't mentioned much about croquet. I was just about uh, to ask you. It was a huge passion of Bob's throughout his life, I think. Um, I, I will um, go right back to the first paper Bob and I wrote in 1973, the order of authorship was determined by a 25 game croquet series to be held, at, uh, which was held at Silwood. Um, that was the only time I think I've ever beaten Bob. Um, you, you, thereafter, he, um, he, he was just triumphant on the croquet lawn, um, as Roy will testify. No, no, not at all. He was fantastic. I, I actually to say something about the the local rules that Bob invented concerning the slope and the action of rabbits um, on the, on, the, on the croquet lawn. So it was Bob invented rules to deal with every circumstance. And clearly, when rabbits had dug holes, you were allowed to prop up um, your croquet ball with a bit of rabbit poo just to circumvent <laughs> it. But I do also remember the month in Bladio, of course, on the first evening, Bob was assessing what sports, games, enterprises were possible. And very unfortunately, there was a table tennis table. Oh, yeah. So every night before supper, we played table tennis. And I started off with a, a 10 point handicap. And I ended up with a 15 point handicap. He got better, I got worse. <laughs> I, actually remember, I actually remember playing croquet when Michael was uh, Bob's partner and I was on the other side. And with a particularly critical shot was lined up, Bob required Michael to go and lie down, putting his feet up on the other side of the wicket so that Bob could line up the shot. 
<laughs> I don't know if you, Michael, remembers that. But uh, we could also go into lots of racket sports. Henry Horn, um, it's a Christmas poem about Bob said that Bob loved to play tennis. He loved to charge the net and then he would serve. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm afraid we're, we're going to have to come to an end here. Um, I hope that many of the people listening will have known Bob and I hope those of you who didn't know Bob will have got some feeling of just how much fun he was and how wonderful it was to work with him and uh, I very much liked uh, Alison's last slide which showed both the first generation the second generation and probably now third generation students of, uh, of uh, Bob and the immense inf influence. Uh, it remains for me to do two things first of all to to thank um, Jennifer Allison and Tim, Simon, Roy, John and Mike very much for um, I think doing Bob proud and finally to say directly to Judith and uh, Noam, um, we miss him terribly, it's not like being family but uh, he was loved by members of the ecological co uh, community and uh, we revere his memory. So thank you very much everyone and we we'll bring the uh, celebration to an end now. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles.